So my name is Joe Christensen. I'm a software engineer here at Amparity on the machine learning team. I also recently finished an undergrad in applied math and computational neuroscience at UW. And I tell you all that, um, shit, because formalizing type math with type theory and things I have a lot of experience in is a very small intersection. Uh, so most of this comes from the, the following sources, but as always, like happy for you guys to interject with, with questions, feel free to interrupt. Also, if you have corrections, feel free to interrupt as well. Um, so the two primary sources are uh, this book, uh, Type Theory and Formal Proof. If you want to come up after and take a look, you're very welcome to. Uh, and then implemented in the Latte Library by uh, Frederick Pishkansky, um, which is a very, it's a pretty elegant proof system. It leverages a lot of the, the things that are native to Clojure as a functional programming language in order to avoid having to re-implement uh, things that you need in order to get your proof system up and running. So a uh, quick example that we'll talk about later, but the uh, idea of being able to define a theorem um, becomes just be, is analogous to defining a function in Clojure and is actually implemented on top of Clojure's function definitions. Um, so you don't have to mess with like managing all the, the definitions of your theorems in your own, uh, in your own special way. Um, so why would you want to do this? Why would you want to sit down and try and formalize mathematics? Uh, this has been something that people have been trying to do for, I think, centuries at this point. Uh, kind of ever since the idea of, uh, I think even before the idea of electronic computers were around, it was, it was uh, decided that we needed a way to be able to boil every single mathematical idea we had down to a few or a small set of simple rules and be able to verify each step along the way. Um, the push to make this automatically verifiable, I think, has gotten more traction in recent years because math is getting huge. There's just, if you think about it as a, you know, a volume that expands, right? It ex expands much quicker than the actual people to, to fill it. And so for lots of new research areas, there are fewer and fewer experts in any particular area in order to verify proofs. And uh, proofs can take, the new novel proofs can sometimes take years to get verified um, or sometimes go unverified. And people build on top of them not being sure if they're correct. Um, also, for me personally, I think there's um, avenues for, for you know, the, the, the one of the spectrum is research and the other end is people learning mathematics. I think there's an avenue for building better tools to dig into to why something is true. You know, usually the loop right now is if you don't know why, you have to go ask somebody else. Um, being able to, to drill down into theorems in the same way that you would drill down into the source code for your library, I think is super valuable. And also being able to, to sit you know, by yourself and explore trying to prove things. Um, is a, that's a much different setup than anything that's possible nowadays. If you, you, your ability to check your proof is only as good as your ability to understand the mathematics you're doing right now. Um, but if that can be, uh, if you can leverage a computer and, and libraries of, art, of proofs to build on top of, then you can start uh, testing out new ideas without having to immediately work with another person or somebody more experienced than you. Um, God damn it. I'm sorry. Does anybody know that uh, Google Slides doesn't work very well when you're in present mode? There we go. OK. So how are we going to do this? So the, the, uh, this boils down to this idea of the Curry-Howard correspondence. And so you have on the uh, left, you have one tuple of proofs and theorems. And the Curry-Howard correspondence says that for you know, certain reasonably large subsets of proofs and theorems, there are exactly analogous programs and types. Um, so what does that kind of mean? I think the example that kind of got me thinking through this is, imagine you have a purely functional program, right? Like a, a little closure program that reverses a string for you. Um, and you can give it any string, and it'll get back the reversed string, right? And that is equivalent to a proof that says that all strings have the property that they can be reversed. Um, you know, obviously, you can wave your hands and make sure that there's no you know, subtle bugs in the way your string class is implemented or anything like that. But if you have an idealized string, you have a program to reverse it, then that's equivalent to a proof that says um, all strings can be reversed. Does that seem to, to jive with people? Cool. So the goal is to be able to build a system that leverages this idea that you can take proofs and implement them as programs um, and use that to make automatically verifiable mathematical proofs. Um, the tool we're going to use is, you know, eventually closure, but the abstraction that we're going to use. Um, Sorry, does this only work for constructive proofs? 
Yeah, so, so, so you there, can't say there does not exist uh, yeah, like uh, a to the six plus b to the six equals c to the six for any natural integers. So, so the natural, the, uh, the basic formulation of this amends itself only to constructive proofs, uh, but you can introduce axioms that allows you to access the full cla uh, classical mathematics. So you can actually, one thing that's actually cool about this, and this is again why I think it's interesting from like a learning standpoint, um, you can trace a proof all the way down to the axioms that it relies on. And so you can see that like this proof relied on uh, excluded middle, or this proof didn't. And so you can, you can you know, it turns, into, it turns your knowledge of whether or not, or what type of logic this proof is implemented in into just the, the roots of, that, of the axiom of your proof. Um, so yeah, so one of the ways you, you can, uh, one of the cool things that you can do in a, in a reasonable proof assistant is instead of just uh, implementing like forms to verify your proofs or programs, you can actually introduce new axioms to depend on. And so that's how you would get out of just being able to do constructive proofs. Um, do people know what the constructive versus classical logic is? Is that, uh, does anybody want to not? <laughs> okay, so uh, in constructive logic, you don't assume that things are uh, either true or false, basically. Uh, so in, in classical logic, you allow that assumption that if I've proved something is, is false, then I know, uh, or if I'm sorry, if I prove something that's not false, then I know it's true. Whereas in uh, constructive logic, you don't, you don't get that assumption. And so it, it limits the, the proofs that you're allowed to do. Um, and from there, I guess, yeah. So, you, so you, most of your proofs end up looking like, and the reason it's called constructive logic, they end up looking like finding a, an example or finding the, the general class of a thing as opposed to just proving that a thing must exist. Does yeah, that mean you can't have proofs? By contradiction? So no, you can still have uh, proofs by con of contradiction by, sh by first proving that things, that things uh, the specific thing you're talking about must be either true or false. Um, but in general, you can't assume that every, th every proposition is either true or false. You don't have that, that, that's the way you introduce it. You introduce an axiom that says any proposition is either true or false. Um, okay, so the tool we're gonna use to, to work our way through this is the, the lambda calculus. Uh, the, the pros of this are, are very expressive. Um, the cons are also that you know, it's, it's very expressive. I think people say this about, about Clojure too. It's a great language to work in if you're working with people that are you know, good at working in it. Um, so to refresh, people want um, lambda calculus is a super simple grammar. You have a, this is a capital lambda. And so you can have let's see terms. You can have applications of terms to each other, and you can have abstraction. Oh, shit. You can see that I haven't been in a math class for a while because I suck at writing Greek letters. So you can always tell recent mathematicians because they're very good at writing Greek letters. Um, so yeah, so this is an exactly equivalent to, to closure if you limited yourself to only using fn and, and one variable. Um, cool. Uh, let's see, an example might be something really easy like the identity function, which is, again, in like for closure would be something like that. Um, okay, so Calculus or lambda calculus. If you if you've taken like a undergrad computer science course, you've probably seen it's like it's Turing complete. It's super cool. You can use it to, to verify a lot of ideas about computation, um, but it has some some limitations. So uh, one thing that comes along with being Turing complete is that sometimes it doesn't terminate. So you might have something like this, where when I take this guy. And I drop it in, I get the exact same form back, um, which is you know kind of sad. Uh, you'd like to be able, if you're trying to build a system where you want to verify proofs, you'd like to be able to know whether or not your proof is correct or not, right? You wouldn't like to, your proof system to give you back an answer that just says, well, well I don't know, because then you're basically it's, you're dealing with a human. Um, uh, the other thing that's interesting is you might have a term like this.
So it just doesn't even doesn't care about its input argument and return something else. And then to that guy, you apply this same sort of like non-terminating form that you applied before. So what's interesting about this case is that depending on your order of operations, if you leave, like if you lazily evaluate this, right? So don't evaluate it yet. Drop it in here, then you'll get out. You'll get out B, and you'll terminate and be nice. If you try to apply, simplify this term first, and then drop it in, so more a more eager evaluation, then you'll you'll get into a, a path where you'll never terminate. And so that also isn't fun. Like you don't want to have to have your proof assistant try and figure out which branch to go down in order to to verify your proof. You want uh, to keep it as simple as possible. Does that seem reasonable for everybody? Okay. So the way we can get around this is by adding types. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very excited that I would give a talk about types to closure programmers. Yeah, this, this is a closure game, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad nobody's like scurrying from the room and saying, you know, you know, melting eyes or anything like that. Um, what makes this okay, the, the, the calculus that we're going to build up, is that our types are a lot cooler than Java types. Uh, we have a lot more flexibility. Um, so we kind of have this full, you'll, 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 call, you'll, you'll hear this called the, uh, the lambda cube sometimes, because you can kind of take each, each one of these, these guys independently. Um, and the, the uh, system of, uh, that has all of them in place is called the calculus constructions. And that's kind of like the, the point of the cube that's diametrically opposite to, uh, to regular lambda calculus. So you'll get terms dependent on terms, which is exactly what we have in regular lambda calculus. You can see that like this term is dependent on the, the term that was in the function. Um, you can also have uh, terms that are dependent on types, uh, which is super cool. So you can have uh, functions. Let's see. If we wanted to write a types lambda calculus function for the identity, we might write it something like this. where this says that any natural number I give, I want to get back that, that natural number. Um, what's a bummer about this is that our, you know, our lambda calculus and our closure identity function is so much more powerful because we can have one identity function for every type. Whereas in, uh, in uh, lambda calculus with types, we'd have to have an identity function for each type, which is kind of a bummer. So we can apply another level of abstraction So we're, we have a two-argument function. So the first argument is the star denotes that this is a, a, the type of all types. So we take in a type first, and then we take in the actual value, and we spit it back out. Um, and so you can kind of think about this like this is, you know, kind of in some ways what the, the JVM is doing under the hood. Like it's tracking the type as well as the value for everything. Uh, and so that's how we're able to get this sort of uh, one single function that allows us to use multiple types with it. Um, so this is called like the, the polymorphic identity type. And that's an example of a term that's, a dependent, on, that's dependent on types, because we're using this arbitrary type as a term. Um, you can also have types dependent on other types. Um, this is like your, your classic like list of ints example. So I, want, I have a general type, and I want to specialize it with another, another type. And then you can also have types that are dependent on terms. Um, and this is something that you don't see in a lot of languages um, because it can add much more computational complexity in order to, to verify that your, your language actually works. But in our case, like, we don't care about doing act any actual computation. Like, the whole point of our language is to verify whether or not it compiles. So the, the compilation is all we're doing. As long as it compiles, then our language is, is good to go. That's the sole use. Um, and so, so a type that's dependent on a term, a good example might be um, if you think about the set of prime numbers for under a certain value, right? So that you could say, I want uh, a type. They're often called like index types, especially if you think about natural numbers. Um, but you could have a type of all uh, prime numbers that are under 10 or something like that. And then as you go up, they'll ha you'll have a different type 
for each natural number. And you could have a function that takes in a natural number and assigns a type to, to whatever you're working with. Another example might be if you think of lists of a certain size. I want to write an arbitrary function like map, and I want to guarantee that it doesn't change the size of my, my sequence that I'm giving in. So I'm going to add a type that says the, the output of this is the same as the, the uh, input size. So the, the size of my output is the same size as my input. And so I can have a list that's length three. Um, I can have my type be a list of three. And the, the uh, value for that is determined by some uh, term that's to be computed. Um, does that kind of make sense? It's like a thing that would be cool to have. Uh, the other cool thing is that there, uh, the, uh, the text and, and the, the logic will spend a lot of time trying to verify that this works. In, in most implementations, or in, in the specific implementation we're looking at, we just kind of fall back on the way the language handles definitions. But the idea of being able to kind of define a term for later is something that you actually have to sit down and formalize. So the, the book actually has a few chapters about you know, how do I want to sit down and formalize a definition? How do I formalize that like an axiom is a valid thing that I can do? Um, but in actuality, the, you can basically sum it up by saying you, you just substitute in names for values. Cool. So let's look at some code. So here's kind of a, a hello world example of um, latte and type theory in general. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, this is kind of like a classic logical statement. So we have two assumptions. All men are mortal, or all people are mortal. And, and uh, Socrates is a man. Uh, therefore, Socrates is mortal. And can people read this OK? Do you want to make it uh, okay. bigger? Yeah, bigger? And biggin. Sweet, OK. Um, I don't think this actually might be our longest proof, so I think we'll be good in terms of screen uh, height. Uh, so you can kind of see what's going on here. We have a context that we build up of four kind of assumptions. Um, we have our actual proof, which is this block. And we'll walk through this more in more detail. Um, and then we have our statement of the theorem itself. Um, so to walk through the, the context first, the thing to keep in your head is that uh, uh, types are theorems, types are theorems, types are theorems, OK? So what this is saying is that um, thing is a, a proposition or, or, or a type uh, or a, a theorem. Um, so uh, something can be a thing or not. Uh, in the, uh, this one is talking about how, or this, this line is talking about how uh, man we can think of as a, a function that takes in some, some thing, you know, in this case, literally a thing, and is a proposition about it. So this uh, takes in uh, a thing and spits out um, an actual type that we, so this is one of those, uh, uh, let's see, this would be a type that depends on a term, because we're passing in a term of type thing, and we get out an arbitrary type. Um, same with mortal. So these are kind of statements you, you can think about this instead of man, you can think about this as like, uh, is man? Because um, once we apply a thing to this, we're going to get out a type. And if we can find a, an inhabitant of a type, then we've proved that the thing is a man. Same with mortal. Sorry, Jim, did you? Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe I missed it. What's the interpretation of equals equals? Oh, uh, this, yeah, that's a great, uh, thanks, Dave. That's a great question. The equals equals arrow. So this is, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to get kicked out of the, the closure talk. Have you ever seen Haskell? This is like the, what you would think of as like the Haskell um, typing of, for a function. So uh, this function, right, is from nat to nat. And so that's what the, that's what the arrow gives us. Okay, this thing to type. Yes. yes, so this is thing to type. Got yeah, I was going to ask, is this like roughly equivalent to this? saying something like a, a function takes a, a thing in and returns a type. It returns uh, a type, yeah. 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 Um, what's a little bit weird, and took, and so don't worry, it took me like, I'm still wrapping my head around it, but. It doesn't return like a specific type, it just returns a type. Sure. Um, so for each, uh, for each thing that we give this, man is going to kind of return a different type. 
Um, and then whether or not we can find inhabitants of that type is, is a, a proof or not. Um, so then uh, here we actually finally have like an instance variable. So Socrates, in this case, is an instance of a thing. And so that now we can start doing some operations on it. Um, so starting down here with the, uh, the statement of the theorem. So what we're trying to prove, remember, is uh, from our two assumptions, all men are mortal, and that Socrates is a man, we're trying to find a proof that Socrates is immortal, right? So what, we would, what this says is we would want to function from our assumptions uh, to, our, to our conclusion. In the same way that uh, in that string example, right, our assumption was this thing is a string, and our conclusion was we can reverse it, or, or we have a reversed version. Um, so in this case, we have two functions, or two assumptions, um, that, are kind of that are joined together by this outer function. So the first is that um, all men are mortal. Uh, and so this says, uh, for anything, so for all things, a specific T, right, of things, um, we have an inner function that says, uh, if there's a, a type, or if there's a valid type, that uh, that thing is a man, then we can conclude that it's immortal. Um, so if we were going to sit back and prove that, then we'd have to find we'd have to find um, a way to take a type or an arbitrary thing t and produce a function of this of this type. If we wanted to prove this assumption, but we're because it's an assumption, we're just taking it as a, as given that we can find an inhabitant of this type. Um, this one's a little bit sim simpler. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Socrates applied to man. So we can kind of unroll it up here. Uh, we have Socrates, which is a thing. We apply it to this function type, or we apply it to an instance of this function type, and we get out some arbitrary type. And so we can assume that because, again, we can assume because we, find, we can find, uh, or we, sorry, we can as assume that we can find an instance of this type man uh, Socrates. Yeah. Insert what I think it might be a clarifying comment. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So that arrow, the equals equals greater than symbol, actually has a dual interpretation because what we're trying to do is we're trying to set up the correspondence between functions and proofs. So on the on the function side, it just represents like this is a function from A to B, but in the proof interpretation, you can think of it as an if then. So what th that is saying is if that first thing holds for all things, it's, if it's a man, then it's a mortal. And if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is a mortal. So on the type side, you're thinking of it as functions, but on the proof side, you're thinking of it as an if. Yeah, exactly. Um, and again, if it helps think about the, the simpler, the simpler string case, I, think, I feel like that's, you know, I, was, I like to have like a good basic thing to come back to. You, you can think about the, this, if you have two classes, string and reverse string, being able to write a function that goes in between them is the same thing as saying, if something is a string, if this proposition holds, then that implies that I can find that a reverse string also holds, that I can find something for that. Um, does that seem does that help helpful for people? Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is this is uh, hopefully satisfied as a as a faithful encoding of the theorem that we're trying to prove. So you always find you need to introduce this thing called thing. <laughs> it's a necessarily a uh, abstraction of both man and mortal, like um, cheating to say man. <laughs> <laughs> to say so it, it, just to avoid the thing at all yeah, entirely. It's illustrative. Um, I think part of it is illustrative. Let's see if we so if we could say Um, Are you saying, is it your question basically, that every situation in which you do this, there's going to be a type called thing? Correct. Is that, is that your question? That's yeah. mostly what I'm getting. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I'm trying to think if, in this specific case, how you could get around it. I think you, you could kind of, you could, um, uh, I wonder if you could just abstract, like, uh, come in with this as an assumption that, like, we're dealing with, with something in particular. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'd have to. I'd have to think about it a little bit more. But yeah, 
I think, yeah, I think you could probably, so I think you could probably get away with doing something like saying, like, uh, man. man is a type yeah. right up here, and then mortal is uh, from man to type, and then down here. Um, but then you, what you lose is I don't know how you would then think about applying Socrates to man. So like you want this specific, like you still need to get a type back that, that, uh, the, that you have um, some proposition that Socrates is a man. Right, because there's a possibility entertained in this thing that Socrates is something other than a man. Yeah, exactly. Um, you, you haven't really defined what plural is. I mean, I, I yeah, can I, read it, but you haven't. <laughs> we're kind of we're kind of hand waving at, at that point where this is uh, to give a flavor, and then we'll we, we can come back to to that. Uh, in in short, it's it's um, an example of of this sort of uh, dependent type, so types dependent on terms kind of strategy. Um, yeah, so the, a for all is basically the, the type of a function. So maybe, maybe it's worth explaining that really quick. So um, if we have some function, uh, let's see, let's just do our reverse string function. So that we can think of this, one way we might write this notation is it's a function from a string to reverse string. Um, but this wasn't, what this doesn't allow us to do is give this, any, this type any information about the specific string that we're working with, right? So uh, one way we could think about implementing, like if we wanted to actually sit down and implement this, right? One way we might implement a reverse string class is that instead of actually changing any underlying data, we're just going to change the first method on this string to get the last thing in whatever my underlying data that's representing my string is. And then nth is just going to kind of work its way backwards. So you can kind of think about this as like changing the, the implementation without changing any of the underlying data. Um, does that kind of make sense? Of something? Like you, so what that allows you to do is like you have a really, you know, like a cost of time reverse string method because you're just changing the way the, the accessors work on that string. Um, the other strategy you can do is actually sit down and like, you know, fucking reverse the string and spit back a new string, right? Uh, but what that would mean is that you have to, th this type of reverse string kind of has to know which specific string it's working with. Um, because otherwise it's just a, you know, it's just a string to string and you lose this like reverse capability. Um, so if you want to actually be able to encode the output, uh, something about the output type with a specific variable, then you can use the for all type, which is denoted with this upside down A for math reasons. Um, so, uh, we'll call this like F. So, uh, in this case, what we're saying is it's, it, this is exactly analogous to functions of terms. This is just kind of a, the equ equivalent of, for functions of types. And so we're, we're taking an, a, a, an S of, t of type string and we're giving you back something f of s that we're going to denote f of s as, as a reverse string. So that's what the, the for all allows us to do is, is make this output type dependent on the specific input term that we're working with. How is, oh, I'll, I'll ask it next so, um, How is the notation that you have above not already implying that, re that reverse string is dependent on the string? Um, yeah, maybe sh sh strings might not be a great example here because it's like kind of hard to think about how you would implement reverse string without. That's kind of the, the, what I was talking about, the, with the kind of swapping the class without changing the underlying data. Um, the other thing to think about too is that. A better example for that might be kind of what you were saying about making sure it's the same length. So you could imagine you might want us to make a statement for all n, a string of length n becomes a, re a reverse string of length n. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the the n would be in the quantifier. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually so that that gives you a way to actually connect information about the first type to the return type. Um, the other thing too is that it seemingly true is that the like if you can encode more information in your in your type system that makes it easier to infer what's going on in your like uh, I think it's reasonable to say that like the more detailed your type is the more could be automatically inferred about the way to implement this function um, and that it just then depends on things that are equivalent from like a, a type level but might be implementation dependent like sorting is a good example of this, where like you could have a very detailed type that that is, that is uh, encoded as with like a poor implementation of sort, that, but that's easy to implement in a type system and easy to, to get to compile, and then have like a really fast like uh, you know something that starts with merge sort and then becomes quick sort at a certain threshold and like uh, you know a really complicated implementation, but that the actual type of, of a sorted list is encoded with like uh, you know insertion sort or something that's like simple but kind of easy to reason about. Um, so that's why you wouldn't just like spend all your time writing your 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 types and then just call it a day. Okay, um, so how are people f feeling about being able to to write theorems? Could you go? Ahead? <laughs> yeah. Are you going to explain about the lambda? Yeah, yeah. So so if we're feeling good about this, then we can talk about um, yeah. I have one more quick For question. Sure. Uh, one thing that I'm struggling with when I'm looking at this is that the nature of the, the logic that we have above is these assumptions that your starting point and then sort of an assertion of, of the result, right? One thing I'm, I'm struggling with is like, it seems like in the notation at the bottom, um, it's kind of hard to figure out where it stops being. Uh, assumptions and then moving on. Yeah, assumptions moving on to uh, the therefore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Supposing you had it wrong here, like you were testing something that wasn't true, mm -hmm. where where does this checker stop? Does that make does that make sense? Does it I say no, your assertion's wrong, or does it say? Well, so so part of it is that like so so the the assumptions part of this block right are are not equivalent to like the assumptions up here. Okay, so the if maybe this is part of your question. So the the assumptions up here are more about like like um, not so much truth, they're, they're more about what, what's the language that I have yep. to work with, like establishing some basic terminology. Yep. And then, okay, and then down here, now we're starting to talk about, okay, what's, given these, like this language, what can I kind of say about, what do I want to assume about certain things? Mm -hmm. How do I, how, like, what's some basic relations? Um, in terms of like the actual, like what, what's assumptions and what's, what's not, it's, it's always just going to be the, the last, like the last term in, in whatever yeah. the function is. Um, so I actually, I nested these for clarity because you, like if you were going to write this out in infix notation, right, you would have an arrow between each of these terms, but it's also perfectly, ex uh, well, perfectly, and then let's see if it actually compiles, but. So this should also be perfectly reasonable, which makes it a little bit more clear that the first n minus one things are, are your assumptions, and then the last one is your, your conclusion. Um, so, it, it, taking that to the next level, you, you wouldn't be able to say uh, something like uh, and, as in part of your assumptions, and mortals are not immortal. You couldn't say Socrates is mortal and he's not immortal. Oh, I guess uh, having two, two conclusions? Yeah. So, one way you can do that is have two separate theorems, right, for that. The other thing is, uh, if we get to it, you can, Sorry, you can okay. implement your and function or your, your and type, uh, your, your proposition. Um, Got it. Okay. We'll, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So for actually like sitting down and proving this, um, again, like we're all we're doing is, is building up functions, right? That's all our, our proof is just is just functions. So uh, this is kind of dressed up to look like logic, but really that's all it is 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 functions. So we have an outer function that takes in uh, an h1 or a uh, so I borrowed these from, from Frederick Piskonski, the author of Latte. Uh, he uses this, this uh, convention, which I like, uh, which is H, uh, H1 stands for like hypothesis one. Um, so you can kind of see this is, it's pretty, once you kind of get an eye for it, it's pretty easy to follow that the hypothesis one 
lines up exactly with the first assumption in your, in your, uh, your theorem. Uh, likewise, hypothesis two uh, just lines up with the second assumption. Um, so like if somebody was to give you a homework problem, right, where they don't give you this part, uh, the, they don't give you the term part, but they do give you this, and said, you know, prove it, then it would be pretty easy to get to kind of here. Because this is just saying, I, this is just kind of the preamble of saying, um, I need a function that takes my assumptions to something. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so now we can start actually, you know, doing some stuff. So we just kind of, you can look through the types that line up or, just, or kind of think it through logically and then try to translate it. Um, so we, we have um, Socrates, which is a type thing. And we know that uh, for all things, uh, if they're man, then they're mortal. So we have a function that we can apply things to. So let's give it a try. So we do that first. Um, and that gives us out a function, right? Because so we're, Socrates is a thing. We're dropping it in to this, this kind of arbitrary or uh, more generalized function type. And we're getting back this function from man of t to, to mortal of t. Um, and so h2 is convenient because it's also a type man of t, because t in this case is Socrates, right? Uh, if we let t be Socrates. So we can see that these two types line up, which is nice. So we can apply that, and then we get out exactly the conclusion that we want, which again lines up with the conclusion of the, uh, the theorem. Yes, yeah, so that's an assumption that we're given. So we're the, the the two assumptions that we're working with. Oops. Are that all men are mortal and Socrates is a man. So H one Socrates returns a function. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is a um, H one is a is a is a type in exactly the same way that like uh, like. In exactly the same way that you might have a function from natural number to natural number, right? Uh, that's exact. That's all this is. It's just a function of, of two types. It's just that the that sorry that's being returned. It's just that we we're, we're allowed to parameterize what those two types are. Uh, and that so in this specific case we can kind of we can unroll it, um, and say that so h one of Socrates. Let's see here. We should be able to do this. Um, Let's see if we can do this live. Isn't life coding fun? Uh, I don't know if this is exactly clear, but this is kind of what we're what we're saying. Uh, I don't know if this will exactly compile, but this is this is basically what we're saying. So we this H one of Socrates, um, I think we'd have to move this up and this this H uh, one up into our assumptions or our, our context that we're working with, but uh, is of type man Socrates to to moral Socrates. Here and actually here, or would people be interested in seeing if that if that checks out? Sounds like a resounding yes. And 
functions correspond to these if-then statements, and function application is the logical principle of modus function. So if you have the first part, then you get the second part. Does this, does this somewhat, seeing this kind of inner part, does this somewhat satisfy the, okay, sweet. Okay, do people want to see and? Yeah. Sweet. So, okay, so what's cool about this uh, is that definition, we don't have to do anything in order to pull this down, like be able to, to verify that like, you know, these, these for all and all these terms actually, you know, end up compiling to Lambda calculus. Like we can just use the, the, the closure, um, like the natural semantics of, of closure definitions in order to get these definitions kind of for free, um, which is pretty nifty. So what and looks like, um, the idea, if we think about and, right, we, we know that uh, it's, it's when you have two things that are true, right? If they're both true, then, then the and of them is also true. Um, the other way you can think about that is, um, let's see, if I have a, so the way we've chosen to define and, which I think is a little convoluted, but ends up being very useful, is if I have a proof that uh, from A and B I can get C. So again, remember in your, in your functions, the first args are always the assumptions, and then the last one is the, uh, the conclusion. So it, this is my type that takes first A, then B, and I, get, then something, I give back something of C. Um, so that, since that's a type, if I have a, that's a, a proposition or a, or a theorem or something like, or you know, something that I want to prove, um, if I have a proof that f from A and B I can get C, um, then and says I can get I can get C. That's the, the definition of and. We can kind of see how this ends up working. Uh, so. This is called an, an intro rule. So given t uh, two propositions, A and B, um, if I have A, a proof for A, a proof for B, then I can conclude A and B are true. Likewise, uh, come back to this one in a second. Uh, okay, doing this in the wrong order. Ugh. So likewise for elimination, we can eliminate on the left. So if we have a proof that A and B, then we can conclude A. And likewise, we can do the same on the right. So given two propositions, if I have a proof of A and B, then I can conclude B. Um, so this kind of works like the way you would think and works. If I have a proof that uh, these the and of these two things are true, then I can know that I can work with them independently. I know at least one of them is true. Um, okay, that's cool. So what's, what's neat about lambda calculus is that in, in regular logic, this is a, uh, a given. This is like one of your assumptions, that this is, this is how and works. In, in lambda calculus, what's cool and what I think makes it kind of powerful is it all boils down to this, this idea like nested function application. Um, so you can actually sit down and say, from this definition of and, I can prove that this is the way it should work. And that's kind of what this proof looks like. And since we're short on time, we'll kind of cruise through at a little bit of a higher level. But um, this, is, this is what like the, the lambda term looks like. What's nifty, too, about um, Latte, the library we're working with, and what makes it a proof assistant instead of just like a, a type theory compiler is that we also have a lot of nice uh, tools for doing this exact same proof, right? Finding a lambda term, um, but in a way that looks a lot more like natural deduction. So we can kind of 
We can assume x and y, which these correspond to our, our adder arguments. We can also assume uh, we have a proposition, and we have some function of the, of the first two to that uh, proposition. Then we can uh, find a fir first term that says, um, if we uh, apply this function once, right, kind of get rid of the first arg, now we have a smaller function, and then function application again gives us the, the conclusion we want, which is C, and so we can QED that. Um, and these, uh, this is like you know, a nifty macro, but really it all, all it's doing is assembling the exact same lambda term that we built up here, just in like a little bit friendlier language. Um, so maybe this would have been a better place to start. You can kind of see like, this is a very reasonable proof, and it has a direct tr translation, um, automatic, to, to a lambda term. Um, what this also allows us to do, we can start thinking about defining theorems. So here's a, a simple theorem. Uh, this is another kind of convention that I like where you, you, it's all in the same arrow term, but you, you have your assumptions on the first line and then your conclusion on the last line. So this is like a very, seems like a very reasonable thing to people believe this is true, that if you have A and B and B and C, then A and C are, are also true. Um, that and is a, it's a transitive thing. So we can here, let's do this. Just to give you an idea of what the, uh, oops. So, let's see, can I, can I uh, help if I, oh, fuck. Okay, um, what I was trying to show you is that this, this try proof gives you a nifty way to um, tackle these proofs incrementally and will give you back error messages as you go. Um, and so you can actually use this as a proof assistant uh, instead of just trying to do it all in one go and then making sure it compiles. Um, but let's see. So this step relies on, on the two rules that we kind of looked at earlier. So and elimination left. So this says if I have an and term that uses propositions A and B, um, which, are kinda, which are just defined from my assumptions, um, and I give it a, my hypothesis that uh, they're true, then because it's left, I can deduce the left one, right? Uh, so I, because this is the, the left guy in the and, I can deduce A. For the right guy in the and, I can deduce B. Um, and the only argument we're passing in here is that this H1 and H2, which is the hypothesis that we actually have a valid proof of these two and statements. And the thing we get back, um, because we've been able to conclude A and B from, or A and C from these two hypotheses, we can use an intro rule which again, these are all just lambda terms under the hood. Um, and these two proofs that we just found, one and two, in order to construct the final term that we want, that A and C are, are both true. Um, so an example of like a you know, little bit more beefy uh, bit of mathematics. Um, Sure. Er, okay. So the bit that uh, Pishkansky kind of culminates to in, in his talk or in his tutorial, which I think is a pretty cool bit, um, is really actually only rely, relies mostly on and. So we if we have a you know we have an okay assumption understanding of and, uh, so we can kind of think about how this works at a high level. Um, what's fun about this too is that we're using functions to prove something about functions. Um, so we have two types that we're working with, um, and we're going to think about what it means to be injective, which is just this idea. Um, and if you don't worry about how we encoded equal, um, which I'm going to assert that we don't for now, then does this f uh, theorem kind of make sense to people? So we, for, for all x and y in this t, which is in the, the domain, 
we've said that if the, if the results of these two functions are equal, then we can include, uh, conclude that the, the input arguments were equal. Um, and so this is the exact definition from, from mathematics about an injective function. Um, Dave, are you feeling haunted? <laughs> from <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so for uh, the, the other def uh, theorem that we want is that if we compose two injective functions, then the result is also injective. So if we have um, one injective function from u to v, uh, and or from uh, yeah from v to u, my bad, and then another function from u to t, then the composition of them, which is just defined very naturally by with the the composition. Um, is, for, is injective from v to t. Um, and so then we can sit down and we can, we can create a proof of this. So let's see, make sure these are both in. Cool. So here, maybe this one will work. Can you just these proofs? Yeah, of course. So, so these two proofs, right, these are the, these are both the, uh, or these are not proofs, these are just the, the things that we're trying to prove, right? Um, do you want me to step through, do you want, these are the, the proof in particular. Um, okay, so for these, these are both just, just uh, the, the function types that we talked about before. So these are like, this is just a function, or th this is a, a function that, that says, given a proof that uh, these two things are equal, um, then I want to, to prove that, uh, the two inputs were equal. Oh, oh, do you mean like, like hypothetically, can we step through it? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's kind of how this, this try proof is supposed to work. So we can see, okay, so we can see that it works right now. If we were to So here we've commented out a uh, like a the the final step of this, right? So we can say that oops, sorry. We can see that oh, God damn it, sorry. Uh, we can see that it says that the uh, it failed, but it's only because the the proof is incomplete. Okay. Uh, if we were instead to say to have something that's that's totally wrong. Um, so instead, form this like uh, and when we fail it, we get a uh, a nice error message that is a little bit you know hard to read on my because the the screen's blown up, but it it gives you a, a pretty good amount of information about what's going on. Um, so we can see here uh, the domain type mismatch. So we can see that um, it expects x, it knows that x is of type t, but the, the domain of f in this case is not t. Um, so this is kind of how, there's not a, a you know, full debugger in this sense, but there's, there's this kind of interaction where I can, I can work on building up these terms uh, with this tri-proof macro and get back help for error, error messages. And then once I'm done, can QED them and make them a full proof. Just to make sure I actually had that right up. Um, the actual property that you just switched there actually is true, right? It's just that the, that the way that you spelled out the injective there isn't. Um, Meaning let's see, our F and G injective. Uh, so they, they, in general, two injective functions, if they're on the same domain, will be injective. Like, uh, but in this particular case, because we're, we have them on two different domains, it's not. So, yeah. Do you use this to prove that your program is true? No. Or, or sorry, do you mean uh, the, the proof assistant itself is true or, or like an arbitrary program? You're, you're making a program. Can you use this to make a proof that your program is true? So that's kind of what, what got me started, like interested in this initially. Um, I think yes. You, you know, you could theoretically. The, the issue is that y um, it becomes very hard to formalize what the assumptions of your, your program are, right? Like, uh, I think the way I would 
attack this if I really like if this was the only way to verify that something is correct is to think about like a good semantic model for what my program does. So like if I was going to have if I was going to you know formalize my system, I wouldn't sit down and formalize like the actual uh, you know chip or something like that. Like uh, try to get the, the the real world constraints, but just say that like you know a, a map generally looks like this and it generally does these kind of things, um, and then formalize it kind of on that level of abstraction. So uh, if you had that like abstraction in place, like all the uh, the the definitions about how your the arguments of your function worked, then uh, or the arguments of your program worked, then yes, you could sit down and, and formalize it. Um, but I don't think I don't think anybody does that realistically yet because it's it's just too it's too hard and unit tests are pretty good so far. Um. Is there is there like has anybody like put like algebra or uh, topology into? Yeah. So so here we can take a step back and look at. Um, I can tell that, that Google doesn't actually do any machine learning because I've Googled Latte a hundred times and it still comes up with pictures of lattes unless I add closure. Um, so one of the cool things about this and other proof systems is that you can have particular parts of math as packages. Um, so here's the main, the main kernel, um, but then there's also like uh, here's a good chunk of set theory and, and, and number theory um, that you can load up and, and use. Uh, I, since it's basically one guy that's been working on, the, on this, uh, I don't think there's algebra or topology yet. Um, but you could certainly sit down and, and reasonably think about building an, an algebra package that depends on set. Um, yeah, and, and same with topology. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's clearly cool that you can take this correspondence between dependent types and proofs, and then your type checker is basically your proof checker. But it's not obvious to me that that is the best way to actually write a proof checker program from scratch if that's your goal. And um, like, you know, if I were, but like it seems to me like it would be possible to write a proof checker routine that checks all those things you have, that have this, have that, follow modus ponens, like as a, as a domain specific language yeah. and just rules to process on that. So what I'm curious about is like commercial level proof checking engines, mm -hmm. do they, are they implemented with this strategy of making it a big type checker or is this um, more of a curiosity of? So Coke, which I think is the biggest one, COQ, yeah. uh, it's implemented in, a, in type theory. Huh. Um, it has, a, I think it's a, a little bit more powerful version of type theory. Um, I think it, if I remember right, the distinction there is we, we kind of only ha allow two level, like two levels in our hierarchy of types. We can have terms. Uh, terms that have types and, and uh, uh, types of types, so like you know the the type constructors kind of idea that I can give it a type and I can get back a, another type, um, but we don't kind of go higher than that. And I think Coke allows for multiple levels of that kind of hierarchy, but it is at the end of the day still type theory, is my understanding at least. Um, I think the the reason the reason being um, again from my understanding. Uh, it's easier to kind of sit down and think about like the the rules of your system and then implement the the nice like assume and have and, and those kind of rules on top of that. And so it's it's easier to write like how have compiles into a type or into a, a lambda than it is to write all the rules for these various steps in your logical system. Um, at least that seems to be the, the mo more fruitful approach. Um, Any other questions? Is this like prolog at all in some way? Yeah. Uh, so prolog is a little different. Uh, prolog is more about like constraint satisfaction. So so given a, it's kind of like. It's like search. There's no searching in here. No, no. So that's actually so so that's a good call out. So um, some people think of proof assistant as something where if I give it an easy enough type to work with, it'll it'll prove it for me. Right. Um, this doesn't have any sort of search capability like that. Um, it, it could eventually, uh, but, but it's not implemented yet, and yeah. 
but there's no, so there's no there's no limitation again uh, on type theory about having like a search function. It's just a different thing to implement. Um, and when I think of and this is from like you know hobbyist knowledge in college and stuff, but like when I hear uh, commercial type or a uh, theorem prover, I think like verifying a, a, a piece of circuitry, right? That's, mm, that's yeah. like a pretty common use of, of these kind of type checker or this sort of kind of fear prover, right? Like you somehow input the all the dependents of your circuits in there and then it'll say, okay, yeah, you definitely can't yeah. the, the floating point error and you're, you're good. I did I did very little electrical engineering, but uh, the the if you remember the Venn diagram, the electrical engineering one would be like a separate circle. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think it I think that's another case that kind of works well with um, this where it, it it's fairly simple rules, so it's easy to, to write the abstraction for the rules, but then the, the complexity of combining them together is very challenging um, to think about how to write like effective tests for. Uh, so I think that's kind of one, like the setting where you might think about doing, um, like, a, like formalizing something where, where the, the overall cost of getting it wrong, right, the chips that run you know, everything, it would, be wrong, it would be bad if we had you know, bugs or, or some undefined behavior in there, um, or like you know, airplanes or something like that. But so there has to be a high cost, but then it also works well when there's a simple set of things, like a simple surface that you're building complex things off of. Cool. Um, what should we walk away from this with? Like, what are the, the top three things? Which yeah. Is pretty heavy. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, I would say pick up, pick up this book. I think there's PDFs around there. If you, if you want to learn more, like if, you, if this is something that you feel like is actually really interesting to you, Pick up this book. I have another book recommendation. Oh, I, I, I actually finish your sure, sure. Um, the other would be again on the, on the path uh, path of learning more. Go work through the the Plotsy tutorial, and don't be frustrated with me if the examples are very similar to the examples I had in my talk because that's where a lot of them came from. Um, but it's also a very a very good introduction and being able to to kind of execute the proofs along with it um, is, is is really fun and a good way to build intuition. Uh, and I guess the other thing to take away is that, like, uh, I, I don't know, I see this, like, sentiment on Hacker News a lot of, like, oh, gosh, like, I hate reading math papers. All these symbols are arcane, and, like, I have no idea what they're trying to say, and, uh, you know, it's super hard to parse, and why can't it just be more like programming? And maybe the, the, the takeaway is that, you know, if you want to make it more like programming, this is what it takes. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not trivial. You have to start at the base and kind of work your way up. Uh, and so next time you're, you find yourself reading a math book, um, you know, think about how you might try to lay it out in, in type theory or in a, a formal proof assistant. Um, and so, like, sometimes it'll be, it'll be fairly easy. Like you, you'll you'll kind of see analogies like, oh, this is really just you know, a function from this to this. And sometimes you'll be like, oh, wow, like that would be you know, really hard to think about how to like effectively encode arithmetic in, in type theory. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, it is. Um, I believe so. Um, I, haven't, I haven't used it particularly. I think there's also uh, Idris, I think, it actually might actually be used more. I think Coke is primarily used for, for math. Uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Idris um, might be used more for, I think it has more ability to interface with your programs. I heard that it was used to prove a C program or an operating Oh, yeah. It might be that the. the yeah, is it the, the, like, is one of the implementations of the JVM or something is proved in Isabelle or something like that? Or? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm Yeah. Um, at the beginning, you talked about um, us sometimes getting proofs executed or something along those lines. Uh, take seven to six years to happen. In, in oh, to, to, to verify, yeah. Yeah, to verify. Um, if this, Say library or, or other libraries like it or Coke for that matter um, were wildly successful. What would the what would the impact be? Yeah, like, I, is that accelerating the, the the time to to verify these proofs? Is it? It's kind of like I think it's. Um, do you ever like you know sit down and you're you're trying to work with like some legacy code and you're you're pretty sure you know how how it works under the hood but you're not 100 percent sure. So you're, while you're writing it, you you have this like hesitation of. I think this is, you know, I, I know this is what I want to do, and I think this is the way the, the you know, the thing I'm depending on works, but I'm not 100 percent sure. And so, in, in in some sense, like it shouldn't change your velocity whether or not this thing works, but like the the fear of that maybe I'm building on something shaky doesn't actually, you know, it makes you slow down. 
um, I think that would be the main benefit from this. Because like, in reality, mathematicians don't spend their time, like nobody gets famous for verifying proofs. So once it kind of goes through a you know, first round of this seems legit, then people can usually just start building on top of it. Um, so I don't think you would see like a dramatic acceleration in, in math. You would just, you would see much less or, or you know, ideally zero of the, we built a, you know, a couple proofs on top of this thing and realized it's false and now have to go back and, and question this whole theory that we've built up. Um, yeah, and also I think the, uh, like, I think the, the like the learning and, and like educational and democratization of it, I think it would be a, a beneficial too. So it's it's less about like, I don't think it'll make the the researchers constructing new proofs that much faster, but it will make um, kind of the ability to to look at like what research level mathematicians are doing and kind of trace that back down to like oh the algebra class that I just took. Um, a little bit more possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing too is like there there are proofs uh, like the the four color theorem in combinatorics was like one of the proofs that was proved solely using uh, a formal proof solver, and it was it would, the only reason it was possible was because it required like uh, like a couple hundred thousand case checks, and so it was like it ended up being like a you know couple gigabyte proof or something like that. Um, uh, so there was like that was one of the uh, if you read like uh, blogs or articles on proof systems a lot of the times they'll mention that because it's kind of like are we sure that this is true because we can't really verify the proof system but the proof assistant says it's correct even though it's like it would be impossible for a human to actually go through and verify that um, so having robust proof assistants would allow us to to do proofs in a, in a more brute force way and so you can you might be able to say I'm pretty sure this is true I just want to check everything. And, and then go from there instead of finding an elegant proof. And to address what you were asking about, can you prove programs correct? I think you kind of said this earlier, which is you, you have to know what you're trying to yeah. prove. You, like, like if you wanted to prove a function that sorted a bunch of numbers was correct, you need to like come up with some definition of here's what a sorted list is, and then prove that this function always produces something that is a sort of list. Yeah. And then you've essentially proven it correct. But you have to kind of know what you're trying to prove about what this function is accomplishing. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the, other, the other book recommendation I was going to say, I actually, um, but so how many of you in here have read The Little Lisper or The Little mm. Schemer? Yes. I've heard you tell me I should read The Little Lisper or The Little Schemer. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this kind of famous book uh, for introducing people to scheme, which, uh, or, or to Lisp, which closure is a dialect of Lisp, um, and written by Matthias Fliesen and Dan Friedman. And it spawned, it, it's this super friendly way of learning scheme through this question and answer system, uh, where like there's an imaginary student and an imaginary teacher kind of having this conversation with one giving problems and the student making wrong guesses and then eventually getting it right. And the teacher's like, good job. And it's, so it's a very friendly read. Um, and there's a whole series of books that have uh, spinned off from that. And one just came out a few months ago um, called The Little Typer. And it's basically this. It's what it is, is it's a, uh, there, there's a little library, kind of, a simple implementation of something like this latte that's small enough that it can be written in the appendix of the book, the implementation. And there's a series of questions and answer format kind of showing you how you would use this thing and building it up from the very basics, each new concept showing how it applies, um, showing this correspondence between the types and the proofs, showing how you can use it to do simple proofs, especially inductive proofs that really lends itself well about proving uh, things about functions that operate on lists. So uh, if you, it's, it's a pretty long book actually. It's much longer than the other Little Lisper books. It's, and it's pretty dense. Like I got it, without typing in the examples myself, I kind of got about, just trying to read it, I got about halfway through and then it was like really hard to follow in my head. So if you really wanted to take it seriously, I think you'd have to sit down and try the examples by hand. But it's, it's a really, really in-depth 
uh, but gently scaling approach to learning something like this. Cool. Does, does this have, uh, does, it, does this relate to homotopy, homotopy type theory? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, homotopy type theory is something that's built on top of like normal type theory, and it, I'm not, a super, I'm not as familiar with it, kind of just, you know, read some about it, but uh, it basically adds this, I, like, so homotopy, or a, a topology, if you're not familiar with, is like, kind of ways to go back and forth between uh, continuous things and, and discrete things. So sometimes it's easier to work with a, a graph, and sometimes it's easier to work with uh, the actual surface, right? Sometimes it's easier to work with a road network, and sometimes it's easier to work with a, a topographic map, right? Even though they might both kind of represent the same underlying structure. Uh, and so homotopy type theory kind of gives a, a continuous analog to some of the discrete ideas in, in type theory. Is it kind of the best way I can summarize it? Uh, so when you define something as equals, you're actually, or like, a, yeah, if you define two things as being equivalent or equal, you're actually defining a, a continuous path in some, you know, arbitrary space between them. And then you can have higher order, you know, paths between paths. And it, uh, the, the, like, uh, advantage in my, to my understanding is that it makes it easy to do things that feel natural to us to actually, to formalize those. So things like, if I have a function that works on, um, integers and it should work for natural numbers, right? But right now in this system, I would have to kind of require a different proof for that and kind of a different abstraction of natural numbers. Um, the, what homotopy type theory does is given um, some proofs of, equ of equivalence between two things, it allows you to generalize other proofs much easier. Again, that's very hand wavy because that's, that's the best understanding I have of it. But it would be kind of the, it's actually like the next book on my to read list after this, after I feel better about this one. Oh. Cool. Any other thoughts, questions? Thanks for letting me do my book report for you guys. Uh, yeah. Yeah.